Welcome to the Mayor of Money podcast with former Burlington Mayor Rick Goldring of Goldring Financial Leadership. In this podcast, we provide successful business owners, including doctors and dentists, with insights to minimize tax and risk while maximizing retirement income and future legacy. Join us for this journey as Rick draws from years of experience and guest experts, including successful entrepreneurs, to provide unique strategies and approaches to estate and financial planning matters, as well as business in general. Now, on to the show. Hi, everybody. Well, welcome to the Mayor of Money, where the Mayor of Money is being interviewed by me, Ralph Ben Murgy. Um, usually the mayor does it, Rick Goldring does it, but this time I'm going to be talking to him about him. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so I guess I'm welcoming uh, the host as, as a guest. Welcome, Rick Goldring. How are you? I'm great, Ralph. How are you? I'm, I thank you very much for, uh, for interviewing me. You know, I, I love doing this. It's what, my favorite thing to do of anything I can think of. And we're going to do this in three different pieces. And the, today I want to talk about like the first part of life, the formative years, the wonder years, as they like to call them. But um, let, let's just take it from being a little kid. You moved around a little, right? Um, actually not. So I, I was born in Paris, Ontario. I never lived there. And my parents were attracted to Burlington even at that time. Um, they had met, a great story, they had met in Jamaica in 1956. In March of 1956, they were both there on individual vacations, and they had a week that was overlapping uh, of their vacations in, in Jamaica, in Montego Bay. And at the end of the week, um, my dad says, well, I, when I finish my vacation, I can, uh, I, I can spend a few extra days in Toronto because that's where my mom was living. And my dad said, if it, if it makes sense for me to do so, my mom said, oh, I think it makes sense. <laughs> and they ended up uh, getting engaged during that time in Toronto. So they knew each other really for like less than two weeks. And they were engaged in March of 1956. They were married in September 1956 in Kitchener. And I was born in August of 1957. I was born on my dad's 45th birthday. And my mom was 41. And that was unheard of back, or not very, you didn't hear that very yeah. often back yeah. then. It's more common today. And they never thought they'd ever have kids, but uh, there I came along and then my sister came along a few years later. So A few years later. So a few years later. had another kid at 43 or 44. Uh, yeah, she was 43 when my sister wow. was born. So, <laughs> so I, I was going to ask why were they were in such a rush, but I, I think I get it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they hadn't been married before. They hadn't had, either one of them hadn't had a serious you know, long-term serious relationship before. So they sort of knew it when they met in Jamaica. It's a, it's a great story. It's unbelievable. I mean, can you imagine two weeks and then it's like, you know, I'll, I'll come to Toronto. Would you like to marry me? <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's pretty crazy. well it. That's and, pretty and, well it. And they yeah. stayed married from then on, right? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. And it was interesting. My dad was a bank manager for the Imperial Bank of Canada at that time in Uranium City, Saskatchewan. And when they you know, were getting married and they were talking about where they were gonna live, uh, my dad said to my mom, well, we've got two choices here. Uh, we can go back to Uranium City or we can go to Shibugamo in Quebec. <laughs> and my mom chose Shibugamo because you could actually drive there. Whereas Uranium City, Saskatchewan, you can't drive there. Maybe you can today, but you certainly couldn't at that time. So. Uh, they lived a year after they were married in Shibugamo and they came back uh, really because my mom was pregnant and they wanted to have me uh, near home, which was Paris for my mom and Beansville for my dad. And so I was born in Paris. Then we lived three years in Winona. And then in 1960, we moved to Burlington uh, when the Skyway Bridge was finished because my dad was a bank manager in the East End of Hamilton. And he didn't want to move to Burlington until the bridge was finished. So the bridge was finished. They moved to Burlington and I've lived in Burlington since that time. Wow. So, so there was a bit of moving around. It's just, you were either not quite there yet or too small to care. Right. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. So when you, so your dad is a bank manager and your mom, did she stay at home? Is that what happened? She was a, she was a stay at home mom initially. I'm, I didn't, my mom worked. Uh, like almost like from the minute we got to Canada, but 
Um, what was it like? What, what effect did your mother have on who you are today? How, how did she help to shape you? Oh, I think in, in lots of different ways. I mean, my dad was very supportive of me uh, playing hockey. My mom wanted me to uh, um, be interested in other things as well. So she encouraged me or probably forced me a little bit to take piano lessons, which I, I, I kept on taking piano lessons till I was in grade nine, I believe, when it was no longer cool to play the piano uh, for that stretch. And uh, my mom was always the one who would use, come up with quotes under different circumstances. One of the, my favorite quotes was, a man's reach should exceed his grass or what's a heaven for uh, by Robert Browning. And my mom was very much uh, an inspiration and, and a supporter and somebody who uh, was a great English teacher and ended up teaching English at Aldershaw High School and was a great English teacher who brought um, Shakespeare alive for her students. And I've heard that from, uh, from many students. Hmm, a little wonderful thing. She also, um, gave you a bit of an interest in politics, or she was certainly interested in politics? Yeah, certainly. I, I remember on, at 3017 Woodland Park Drive, because I grew up in, in Roseland, and it was not a big house. The people that have it now are our are, 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 are future owner, are, sorry, owners that bought it from my parents, and then after that, uh, expanded the house significantly. But when I was a kid, it was a very, very small house. And I remember sitting in the in the kitchen and talking about politics. And I was, you know, six, seven, eight, maybe eight years of age when that interest came out. And one of the uh, pieces that encouraged me to be interested was the fact that my uncle ran for the Conservatives when Diefenbaker was on his way out uh, hmm. in the 60s. And so I was interested in that. And my mom was very interested in talking about uh, politics, as my dad was to some degree. Uh, but I remember the 1968 federal election. Uh, I I asked my mom if we could, if I could skip school one afternoon to go see P the newly um, crowned liberal leader who became prime minister in 1968, who, who was Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and that was in the parking lot of Central Arena. He spoke at the staircase to the uh, east side of the building, and it was packed. The parking lot was packed, and that was in 1968, and. I, I felt I, I really identified it more as a conservative when I was that age. And uh, we went to see a Robert Stanfield rally in Hamilton. And I remember Lincoln Alexander was running in Hamilton West for the very first time. And we couldn't get into the main room to see Stanfield. So they had it on closed circuit TV. But Lincoln Alexander came into the room that we were in watching it on TV and shook everybody's hand in the uh, in that particular room. So. I remember that still very, very well. Well, you know, you were in 1968, if you'd gone to a, a rally, uh, it was Trudeau mania. It point. was Trudeau mania. It was huge. Absolutely. You know, the energy would have been rock star. He, he, it, he, it certainly was. It certainly was. <laughs> he had a certain magic, didn't he? Like, you know, he he brought something that you never saw. Uh, somebody who pirouetted away from the queen. And, you know, he had a whimsy that you don't see in politics anymore. It was... It must have been something to see him up close like that. Yeah, it was. And I think of the FLQ crisis and that famous interview he had in front of Parliament Hill, uh, where they said, well, you know, with regard to the FLQ and the War Measures Act, well, how far will you go? And he just said, well, just watch me. Just and, watch and me. Just watch, watch me. me. <laughs> and he says, we can't, we can't let these bleeding hearts get in the way of uh, law and order. Um, he, he didn't. He said it the way he saw it. He, he said it the way he saw it. Yeah. And uh, did Stanfield leave any impression on you, or was was he just sort of like? Eh. Uh, he was a solid guy. He, he right. was a he was a solid person, and a lot of people would refer to Robert Stanfield as the greatest prime minister we never had. Hmm. A and uh, obviously, he didn't have the sparkle of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, but he certainly was a, a respected uh, leader, and he was a former premier of Nova Scotia, and he had a, certainly a good record there. And I think he did as good a job as he could have under the circumstances uh, when he was in Ottawa. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting thing to be that young a kid and already have picked a party that you think you're aligned to and going to see rallies. Uh, was your mother trying to like encourage you in that direction or was she just saying you should be aware of what goes on in the world? Uh, I don't know if, if she had to encourage me. I, I just seemed to be interested for whatever mm. reason. Um, and it wasn't just in the federal politics, it was provincial as well. 
I remember, I think it was the 1971 uh, provincial election and George Kerr was our member of the legislature in, in Burlington. And I remember Bill Davis and Peter Lougheed coming into Burlington for a rally for George Kerr. And I remember, I remember they were in a, in a limousine parked right across the street. And I remember walking by the car and identifying them in the car. I went, my goodness, that, that was uh, Bill Davis and Peter Lougheed. And uh, that's another memory I had when I was a little bit older. What were you, as, as time went on, uh, what was Burlington like for you? As, you know, because I'm, I'm sure it wasn't what it is today. What, what, when you think of your childhood in Burlington, what other things come up for you? Well, certainly, certainly playing hockey. Um, you know, I only played house league hockey, but I was a big part of your life as a kid and, and all your friends played hockey and, and you used to focus on, you get excited to go to practice, you get excited for your one game a week. And I guess, you know, when I started playing when I was eight and that carried on for probably at least half a dozen years. Um, but, um, you know, there used to be in Burlington, I think there still is, but it's on a more grandiose scale, uh, a minor hockey day. So in Burlington, I remember uh, in 1968, I believe, going to the old Central Arena, uh, the old Central Arena, and the new Central Arena was built in like 1967, but the old Central Arena, where if the wind blew more than 30, 30 miles an hour, you couldn't play because they were worried <laughs> about the roof caving in. But I remember Bobby Orr in his rookie season was refereeing for the age group that I should have been playing in that final game, except we lost the week before. And I remember just walking into the arena and sitting beside Bobby Orr as he was putting on his skates to go out and, uh, and referee for part of the game. And, uh, it, you know, it was, it was different, but minor hockey day, all the championship games for minor hockey were on one day. And every year they brought in a NHLer uh, to show up and, do some autographs and and it was always typically from the visiting team that was playing the Leafs that night and so what position did you like I played uh, left wing left wing left wing so, so so you could skate faster than me because I, I played defense I waited for you <laughs> here he comes again um so but and I guess as most kids you you thought one day I'm going to play in the NHL uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't think that. No, <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to play in the in a NHL. But, you know, you go back in those days and this is a, a sad reflection on the impact of climate change. But we had a backyard rink every every winter that my dad spent a lot of time on. And we'd have months of activity in the backyard, skating in the backyard. And uh, that was that was very common back then to have backyard rinks. And it isn't as common today. And a large part of it is because the weather isn't consistent. How did your dad shape you? Um, my dad was a bank manager. He was, um, he, he was always very respectful of other people. Uh, whenever there was any discussion about certain relatives, um, he would never be the one who raised it, but he would always say something like, it's a beautiful day outside. And, and that was his cue to change the subject because right. he thought personal comments were in bad taste. And he just didn't see any point in talking about anybody if they weren't in the room. And uh, so my dad was a very respectful uh, man with a lot of integrity. Mm, I love that because it, it's so easy, especially in a family, to start gossiping about the, whoever's not there, you know, Uncle Bob or whatever. But, yeah. <laughs> so, but he, that's, that's a sign of his integrity. I guess he was also signaling to you there's a certain way to be in the world. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We, we did a lot of camping trips. We had a tent trailer and we went down to the Maritimes a couple of times. We went uh, to northern Quebec. I saw where I was conceived in Shibugamo. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we went to northern Ontario. And on our way back from northern Ontario, we went through Wisconsin. And I remember uh, we were camping at a campsite in a state park in Wisconsin. And they said, just go ahead. Like there was a sign, just go ahead, park set up somebody will be around to collect the money. And I remember thinking, well, we got to make sure that we pay, but they never came around. They never came around to collect the money. And as a kid, I remember saying to my dad, well, we got to pay. So my dad made a point of sending the money to the state of Wisconsin to cover off the cost of our campsite. Hmm. And 
So I was the one who encouraged my dad to do that, but I think it's because of who my dad was. Yeah, it's kind of an ethical circle, right? Where you yeah, see absolutely. him in a way, and then you go, well, no, that's the way you're supposed to be. You don't just go, I got away with it. <laughs> right, and, right. Right? So uh, high school goes. Uh, did you know, did you start to get a sense of what you wanted to do with yourself? Or were you just, because, you know, some people are great at high school, and some people are like, oh, get me out of here. Yeah, I wasn't the greatest at high school. I didn't really um, have great work habits. And uh that really came to the came to a head in grade 11 when I got a 45 mark on my first report card in grade 11 English. And my mom was an English teacher across the city at Aldershot High School. Needless to say, she wasn't <laughs> happy. Um, but with a little bit of guidance from my mother, I ended up with a 75 or a 78 in the course that that year, but she was not happy uh, <laughs> with me. So when I was in grade 13, we had five years of high school back then. Uh, I wasn't too sure what I was going to do. I thought it was I was going to go into business or radio and television arts at Ryerson. And it turns out that I couldn't didn't have the marks to get into business at Mac. So I ended up getting into arts. I, I took a degree in economics, a uh, three year past BA, and then couldn't wait to get out and start working. What was it about school that didn't capture you? Um that's a that's a good question. I don't it just um, yeah, it didn't capture me. You're absolutely right. I could turn it on. I could get the marks when I needed to get the marks. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't I don't have an answer for that, Ralph. I guess it wasn't practical enough that I could apply in life because after I graduated from university, I started the life insurance business with Sun Life in 1979. I you know really enjoyed that and took all the courses and took my charter life underwriter, my certified financial planner designation. And I have spent far much more time and money in um, education after right. university than I did in university, that's for sure. Once you could apply it to something that you cared about. Exactly. Then it, then it became, exactly. oh, I actually dig this. Yeah. And, exactly. And is it a coincidence that your father was in, in the financial world and you ended up thinking, I want to be in the financial world? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so, because my dad was not a great believer in life insurance. He was not a great believer in uh, life insurance agents. Uh, he thought <laughs> they were just a bunch of salespeople that were, weren't were there for the customer, per se. And uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't really believe in the product, I don't think. Um, they used to I come over to the them. house. Or they, used to come over to, they used to come over to the house. The life yes. Insurance. Is that what exactly. you did? You'd go into people's living rooms and talk? Oh, yeah. Them? Yeah, for sure. Oof. I always thought that was like, wow, I, you know, this is personal. You're in my room. I can't get rid of you. You're sitting in my living room. Well, you know, there's something special about, um, you know, you get referred to somebody or you meet somebody and you end up, you know, making a connection. And you end up arranging an appointment. And there's always that sort of little bit of past tension at the beginning. And, you know, by asking people questions and, and sort of setting the, the tone of how the discussion is going to go and what you're going to do and not do. And then at the end of the process, somebody becomes a client and you've put into place some good risk management strategies using different insurance tools. And there's something very tangible about doing your job well when you've implemented these risk management tools and you know that the family's protected. If something mm -hmm. happens to mom, if something happens to dad, there'll be enough money there for mom or dad to continue on and uh, look after their family and raise their family. If a major breadwinner, you know, gets sick or a major breadwinner uh, gets a critical illness or dies. Yeah. With things people don't like to talk about, but they should plan for. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, that's what makes the, uh, that's what makes the business challenging, but also makes it very satisfying. Yeah. So you you went through all that. Did you get married somewhere in there? Uh, I got married. Uh, yes, I did. I got married in, uh, in 1985. Uh, and uh, my first wife and I had three wonderful girls. Um, and, uh, and then I was remarried a number of years later. And uh, now um, we've been married for, for many years, uh, Cheryl and I, and we have seven daughters between us. <laughs> And five grandchildren now. Well, you've got a musical for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> Seven yeah. brides for, you know, this is nuts. So your first three kids, uh, you're going along in your life. Uh, I, 
there's that thing where you realize this isn't going to work in, in a marriage sometimes. So that must have been difficult. It must, you know, you obviously cared about your children and all that. How, how did you navigate that? Because people really have a lot of trouble with that. Yeah, certainly. My kids were, were, were quite young. And, um, you know, the guidance I got from, from talking to uh, um, counselors was, you know, look after your kids, just be there for your kids and, and your kids will be fine if you're, if you support them and you make sure, you know, you're in their life uh, on a regular basis. And with the age, of, the advice I got was the age of your children, you know, what you hear often is, well, I've got my kids every other weekend when people are separated or divorced. Well, I didn't think that was going to work. So I, and after the input I received from a counselor of making sure I have lots of contact with my kids at such a young age, uh, I came up with a schedule that my, my, that my ex-wife was supportive of that I would have my children for, for dinner and after school and dinner and early evening every Tuesday, uh, the same on Thursday, except they would stay overnight on Thursday and I would take them to school on Friday morning and they would be with me every Saturday night uh, or every Saturday from like, like two or three in the afternoon to four or five in the afternoon on Sunday. So I basically saw them every other day. Um, so I had that regular contact and I was fortunate to be in control of my schedule because as my kids got involved in sports and particularly soccer and, and basketball and school basketball and school soccer and school volleyball, I was able to go to almost every one of their games because I was in control of my uh, my schedule. So, you, you know, I think if as long as you love your children when you're going through that and, and you um you know, take the effort to make sure that you're, you're there for your kids, your kids will do just fine. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's never something you, you want to think is going to happen. Uh, and then it happens. And then it's how you handle it. And, and what signal you send to your kids about love and about devotion and all those things. And you did that. So that would have been a great feeling. So then you meet a woman who has uh, more daughters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so was there any moment of like oh my god we're, we're like we're, this is going to be like the Brady Bunch this is not there's going to be so many people in this house yeah you know I I I, I joked Ralph when I was mayor I'd be introduced as you know the um you know because I we'd have seven daughters and that would come up in the introduction and I would say you know the big issue of the day is intensification in our community and when Cheryl and I got together, we took a three bedroom house and turned it into a seven bedroom house. <laughs> and that's a great example of intensification using the same space for more and more uh, people. So a um, couple nights a week for a number of years, we had six out of our seven daughters under the same roof. Um, and that, uh, that became a little challenging on occasion. <laughs> and, I, and I give my wife Cheryl full marks for helping navigate the whole blending of our families because uh, I didn't help. I know that I did not help, but she made sure that uh, she did whatever it took to make sure that that we blended well. What have you learned in being a dad? What have I learned in being a dad? That's a great question. Um, I've, I've learned the, well, I've, I've learned a lot of things. I mean, I think uh, you know, there are times when I've been a great father to my children, there's times where I haven't been a, a great father. And I, I think it's a case of, um, you know, understanding some general psychology. And one of my, one of my favorite expressions is force negates. And the stronger you push something, the more resistance you get. And that goes with your kids as well. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think we parents push too hard, and maybe sometimes we don't you know, push hard enough, but I think I eventually figured out the, the appropriate balance of encouragement and support versus pushing. And a good, a good parent has to encourage and provide support, but you can't be overly aggressive or pushy with it. You have to be understanding and supportive in your tone. Yeah. And uh, I have only boys and you have only girls. So I'd imagine there were different paths, but like you said, being a dad, sometimes it works really well for you. And, you know, at nine in the morning, you're a great dad and at 1030, you're cranky and sarcastic <laughs> and have to go take a walk to cool down. Um, but it, 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 it's an ongoing life lesson. Now, what have you learned about being a granddad? 
Uh, being a granddad is, 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 is pretty neat. We have five grandchildren. Uh, my stepdaughters have, uh, have those five uh, children or five grandchildren. Um, and it's great. You know, you can come into their lives and, uh, you know, when they come to visit and, you know, develop a, a meaningful relationship and, and, and play with them and have a conversation with them. And I always try to have an adult conversation as much as I can, even if they're four, five or six or whatever age. And it is interesting sometimes the responses you get back, <laughs> but it, it's, it's, for me, it's just the case of, um, of loving them and, and being supportive of them and, and engaging with them and as much of a conversation as you can have. You know, uh, I just thought about the you sitting in someone's living room trying to convince them to deal with things like the fact that they're going to die one day and how to make sure they take care of themselves and financially and all that. You have to really become a student of, of human behavior at a certain point. What, what have you learned about what motivates people and what what doesn't in the work that you've done? Well, I, I use the expression force negates and, and the stronger you push something, the more resistance you get. And I think that that can be applied in so many different sets of circumstances with your children, with working with, with clients and encouraging them to take the right action. I mean, ultimately it's their decision. They have to decide what's right for them. And, and it's up to me as the advisor to give them my best advice and, and encourage them to take appropriate action. But, you know, if I've, if I have um, gone through the right process uh, with my prospective clients, um, then it's just a case of them making the decision. And typically when you, when you follow a good process and you do the right analysis and you ask the right questions and you make the, the appropriate recommendations, uh, typically people take the action that they need to take. And I think that, that applies in so many different sets of circumstances and certainly with your children. Uh, you, you know, you can encourage and support, but you can't, you can't push. Yeah. And we all want to make our own decisions. We all, um, you know, a lot of us uh, don't like change. Um, but if we make the decision around change that we want, then we're okay with it. Uh, you've lived in the same town, Burlington, uh, for your whole life, mostly, right? So um, a lot of people don't do that anymore. They stay for a period of time. They move to another place with affordability. These days, people move out of places they want to be in because they can't afford them. Um, but one of the advantages of being in, in your hometown is I would assume you have lifelong friends at this point. I do. Yes, I do. I, I have, I have uh, friends, uh, one particular friend. Uh, he's retired to Northern or to the Kawarthas. But we were in the same kindergarten class. Um, so yes, I do have relationships going back uh, many decades. And it is pretty special uh, to live in a community when you go out, anywhere you go out, often you run into people that I know. And it isn't, and most of the time it's people I've known for, for years prior to serving as a counselor or mayor. That's a lovely gift though, right? I mean, you, you get to deepen those relations. Like you don't even have to say anything. You see them after, you know, you've known them for 15 years. You can just sit in the same room and go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> right, there's no work to it. Yeah. Uh, so when you look now at, at life, at, at where you've been, but where you want to go, do you still dream? Do you still care about, mm, maybe you could do, or you just sort of, I'm good where I am. It's all fine. You know, Ralph, I, I've got I've got lots of objectives and goals that I'm that I that I continue to strive for. Um, I'm more focused than ever on what I'm doing, and in, in a, at a subsequent podcast, we'll talk about that. Um, but I've always I'm, I'm fortunate to have been in a business where personal and professional development is encouraged in a significant way. And as I mentioned earlier, I've, I've spent a lot of time on me. And in getting better as a as a dad, getting better as a husband, getting better as an advisor, uh, getting better as a citizen, um, and I will continue to strive to get better. I think you know we're all built for for achieving things in our lives, and it doesn't matter what it is. And it's the journey that counts. It's the journey that counts. It isn't necessarily getting there. And yes, getting there is great, and that's what you want to achieve. But it's the challenge of getting there and the challenge of the journey, recognizing that throughout life and whatever you endeavor to do, there will be highs and lows and ups and downs. And, and you, you, you're accepting of that because that's all part of the process. 
and it makes the process and the results of the process so rich and rewarding. Sounds like you took your mother's advice at the very beginning, the grasp and the reach, right? Like just oh, absolutely. Keep, right? Absolutely. Like, don't sit on it. Just, just try to get a little further ahead of it. It's lovely. Um, in subsequent uh, uh, chats we're going to have, we're going to get to talk about your life in politics. And we're also going to get to talk about uh, money and being the mayor of money and what it is to, to do this right and, and to... Uh, to do it with the ethics that you already bring to it and everything else. So I'm looking forward to both those conversations. Thanks for telling me all this stuff. I really appreciate it. And it's good to let people get to know you even better than they do now. Well, thank you very much, Ralph. And I look forward to our, uh, our next discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Rick Goldwing and the Mayor of Money, my friends. Thank you for listening to the Mayor of Money podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. If you'd like to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Rick or have an idea for a particular guest or topic, contact him at rick at rickgoldring.com. See you next time on the Mayor of Money podcast.